Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today I will be presenting a case of a 38-year-old female who presented to her ear with complaints of generalized itching, facial edema, with an episode of LOC lasting for 30 seconds and two episodes of vomiting. On 10 second initial assessment, her airway was patent, no pooling of secretions. Breathing was bilaterally equal, chest, uh, chest movements were bilaterally equal, air entry was bilaterally equal, no added sounds. Respirate rate was 20 per minute, saturation was 99% on room air. So coming to circulation, heart rate was 92 per minute, BP was 70, 40 millimeters of mercury. So immediately uh, we uh, started on injection adrenaline 0.5, uh, 0.5 uh, milligram, which is 0.5 ml of 1 is to 1000 IM was given and a 18 gauge IV cannula was secured. Okay. 2 liter NS IV bolus was given and a ECG was ordered. BP was reassessed and after 5 minutes BP was reassessed and it was 100 by 60. Coming to disability, GCS was E4, V5, M6. Pupils were bilaterally equal and reacting to light, moving all four limbs. Exposure, her GRBS was 106 and temperature was 96. Uh, she had a swelling of size 3 into 3 cm over her right parieto occipital region. Right parieto occipital region. region. Okay. 3 into 3 cm. Yeah, 3 into 3 cm. Okay. Adjuncts of primary survey. Okay. Let's uh, be here. So, we have a uh, middle aged lady yeah. who presented with uh, itching, arteria, and breathing facial difficulty, edema. facial edema, immediate. It yeah. was a sudden onset. Sudden onset. Sudden onset or it gradually it was worsening? Uh, initially, uh, she uh, gave us a history of taking uh, chimeral fort. Okay. After 20 minutes, she started uh, initially developing itching and facial edema. Chimeral fort or chimeral lyser D? Which one? Chimeral used? fort. She Just said plain serashopeptides. Yeah, serashopeptides. Yeah, that was the yeah. only thing. That is the only trigger uh, she gave okay. as a history. And following that, uh, 20 minutes after that, she started developing itching. Okay. And it was followed by facial edema. After five minutes, uh, she was like walking, and again uh, she fell. Uh, she had a loss of consciousness. Okay. And she fell down. Okay. And uh, after that, uh, like after 10 minutes, she had a one episode of vomiting also, and she was she brought to the, the ER, ED. Yeah. So basically, we are dealing with a patient with a possible drug-induced anaphylaxis followed by a history of fall. Fall, yeah. So I just wanted to know what was the cervical spine also. Any tenderness was no, there? No, she spent tenderness no, was, no, was, was not there. Was not there. there. Not there. Thing was there. Just everything was clear was and clear. only there was a swelling. Swelling was swelling. there. Yeah. Okay. 3 into 3 and she had a couple of episodes of vomiting. Vomiting. Following immediately uh, following this or later on? After, uh, five, after 10 minutes after the... After 10 yeah, minutes she had... She had, then she, she had vomited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, we have two issues here. One thing we have to deal with is the anaphylaxis and second thing is the head injury. Head injury. Whatever she had, uh, the fall and we need to manage that also. Okay. So uh, you thought, uh, so what was the, what is the diagnostic criteria to say that this is an anaphylaxis? So what are the things that is positive to say this is anaphylaxis? Okay. She had a uh, possible trigger history. Okay. Trigger history. Followed by, uh, immediately followed skin by Skin and mucocutaneous involvement. Yeah. Skin and mucocutaneous, mucocutaneous involvement is the with circulatory, circulatory compromise. compromise yes. So basically she presented with an anaphylactic shock. shock yeah. We can tell to that extent. So after, but after serratiopeptides, how frequently you have to but any drug can cause, uh, we have to just cross verify whether it was containing any diclofenac. So diclofenac is one agent which is very common to produce this sort of a symptoms and uh, it is very commonly associated uh, with the uh, serratiopeptides and diclofenac combinations are free, freely available. Lyser D is the brand name that we commonly use. So that one we need to, why she was taking climoral food? Uh, she had a, a previously a, a plastic surgery. Okay. Uh, for the uh, sewing needle was inside her index finger. Okay. So for that, uh, after the surgery, post surgery, they gave the. So definitely, there would have been associated diclofenac into that. That's what I feel okay. because uh, post surgical pain management they had given yeah. not only just for healing. So serratiopeptides along with uh, diclofenac might have been there. We are, we are not very sure, but diclofenac is very notorious to cause these things. Yeah. So she has taken the first dose or before that she has taken any? She had taken in the morning okay. one dose was taken. Okay. But that time she didn't develop any symptoms. Symptoms. But afternoon, uh, that time it was, uh, she also took other medicines also. The antibiotic was taken. Okay. And one painkiller was also taken. Okay. Okay. Uh, but afternoon only she took this medicine only. Okay. Yeah. 
so that we have to verify so one thing with sarah shopped it is very very rare but we cannot uh, say that uh, it will not cause any drug can cause okay so she had come to you and uh, you uh, evaluated her and you have found out that she is in circulatory shock okay. so immediately you went ahead with uh, 0.5 mg MGA. of 1 in 1000 adrenaline IM. im uh, suppose uh, she didn't uh, improve after giving an im what would you would have done her blood pressure was still 70 40 after the fluid bolus and after your im first dose of adrenaline she is there is no improvement after your 5 minutes assessment there is no improvement so what you would have done uh, initially you can repeat another one more dose, dose so that is the next thing you can repeat another 0.5 mg of adrenaline and the problem here in in this issue is that no when you are giving the sub q and im the patient is already in shock so the patient already in shock the absorption part is going to be questionable so when the patient is otherwise like 120 80 blood pressure only mild anaphylaxis or there is no shock the absorption will be much faster so some patient because of the hypotension the absorption might get delayed so you need to repeat one more dose yes. and still the blood pressure doesn't improve what you will do iv you can you can start as an iv infusion IV. protocol you can start so how will you prepare an iv solution of adrenaline now iv solution we have to take uh, 0.1 mg of adrenaline and we have to dilute it in 10 ml ns and give it over 5 minutes okay that is one thing the easiest That's way you can easy. take the same 1 ml and you dilute into 100 ml so each ml will become how much so 100 ml will have 1 mg yeah. then you can go ahead with 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour as an infusion. infusion as an infusion you can give so that is another way of giving adrenal infusion so that is one way of giving you said this one method like you take 0.1 mg of adrenal into that and add into a 10 ml of normal saline so it will become 1 in 1 in uh, 10000 1 in 10000 initially it will be 1 in 10000 you are adding then you are diluting it yeah. further and you are giving as a slow infusion yeah. so that is one way other than that you can give this way also you can take 1 mg you add it to 100 ml of normal saline then you start the same thing as till your titrate decide effect so what is your effect that you are looking for the hypotension okay. so once the hypotension comes down you can decrease the dose of iv adrenaline so that is uh, your adrenaline and you are given the fluids and if hypotension is worsening what you will do still after so adrenal infusion then we have to anaerobic you can give for other uh, vasopressor agents like noradrenaline you can think of adding noradrenaline also and for respiratory what all things you can add respiratory, respiratory is, symptoms uh, bronchospasm you can give nebulization prodromium bromide or uh, salbutamol nebulization all those things can be tried for the respiratory symptoms additional respiratory symptoms so so that is in a nutshell regarding your anaphylaxis and refractory anaphylaxis management so uh, now what are the commonest differential diagnosis that you will suspect when a patient is coming with anaphylaxis here there is a trigger suppose there is no trigger mm-hmm. suddenly a patient is coming with full facial swelling uh, lip edema and uh, there is a tongue edema you think it is anaphylaxis and you start giving adrenaline there is no improvement in giving adrenaline and she is saying that she is having this previous episode of uh, Uh, an anaphylaxis sort of a symptom she had previous uh, history so four differential diagnosis you have to con- consider whenever you have similar picture one is anaphylaxis next one is hereditary angioedema Angio. so it is as the name implies it is hereditary okay. angioedema then you can have arb or ac inhibitors AC. induced angioedema and finally you can have idiopathic angioedema you don't know what costs this angioedema so these are the four differential that you need to keep in your mind so how will you differentiate each one of them definitely you will have a trigger and mucocutaneous and urticaria in anaphylaxis the rest three of them will not have any urticaria or any other mucocutaneous and other urticaria skin related thing will not be seen only in anaphylaxis you will get this itching and all those things the rest three of them they will be just having this angioedema lip swelling yeah. facial swelling and all those things and when you look into the triggers when you look into the trigger the trigger in anaphylaxis will be a drug food allergens or anything hereditary angioedema you don't see any trigger it can be just an infection or a just a stress can produce this so it basically it's a c1 stress deficiency what is the uh, creating the issues there so for that group of patient you will not see any trigger and it runs in the family and usually it's seen in the first or second decade so that is a time frame where usually the hereditary angioedema occurs and they will have frequent episodes like this not improving with adrenaline so what is the treatment that you need to give is 
fresh frozen plasma or uh, there are certain drugs which is not available in our c1 stress inhibitors not available in our uh, country certain drugs are not available fresh frozen plasma or you can is lot of other protein derivatives are available so that is a basic treatment for your hereditary angioedema but we will have we have 20 or 30 patients coming to you with uh, anaphylaxis sort of symptom one will be hereditary angioedema Till now, I think we have seen some 5 or 6 cases in our ED itself. So, keep that thing in your mind, hereditary angioedema, without any trigger, without any skin involvement, but there is a lot of edema and swelling that you have to think in terms of hereditary angioedema and family history also will be there. The next group that we see is the ARB induced. So, it is very clear it is due to either an AC inhibitors or an angiotensin receptor blocker. So, they classically will have again arteria will not be there. Only the lip swelling and tongue swelling will be there and the patient will be on any of this drug. Then other one is idiopathic. You don't see any causes. It can be part of patient is treating for a malignancy. Suddenly is coming up uh, with an history of similar episode of anaphylaxis. You are not knowing what exactly is causing this thing. So, that is idiopathic or there can be certain other infection also can trigger those things. But we are not find, able to find any cause. So, both four of this we initially we will manage just like anaphylaxis. But when what will happen is that after that you are not getting an answer why the patient had this. Then you have to think in terms am I dealing with either an hereditary angioedema or it's an ARB. So, drug definitely we will look into ARB induced or third one it is idiopathic. So, any of these things will be placed without skin involvement always keep this as your differential diagnosis. So, that is regarding your anaphylaxis management. Now, this lady again had a swelling and she had a brief period of loss of consciousness and two episodes of vomiting in the ED. Now, the score is 15 by 15. Yes. So, what will you do about her head injury? Head injury, uh, when I checked, uh, the pupils are equal and reacting to light. Okay. No focal neurologic deficits were there. But so she can had an episode of vomiting. My, my question is, can you send her home? That no, is no. my question. You have to rule out an IC bleed. Okay. okay. So, uh, so, what... According to what you wanted to, we want to do a CT scan. That's what you are saying. Have you done a CT scan <coughs> for her? Yeah, we have done a CT scan. Have, what is the indication to do a CT scan? Loss of consciousness. She had a loss, loss of, of consciousness. consciousness. So, uh, can be the loss of consciousness secondary to the hypotension? It can be. It can yes. be hypotension. So, here we are not very sure the LOC is due to uh, the head injury. It can be due to hypotension. But in this background, definitely there is an indication to do a uh, CT scan. And the CT scan you can do and uh, you can discharge. If there was no LOC. Imagine that there was no LOC. So, what you would have done? You keep her under observation. observation. For next 6 hours, you keep uh -huh. her under observation. She is still having persistent vomiting or any drop in GCS in between or her vomiting episodes are worsening. Then you go ahead and take a CT. So, that's a simple. There is nice guidelines. A lot of guidelines are available for this. But there is a simple thing what you have to remember. Whenever you see that mechanism of injury, the patient on anticoagulants, you are pretty sure that there is an LOC, there is a seizure, there is an evidence of base of skull fracture, there is a epistaxis. All those things you go ahead straight away with C, uh, straight away with a CT brain. And rest of the condition depending upon elderly male, directly above 65, alcoholics. This group we have to take a CT. Otherwise you can just wait and watch. Depending upon their other clinical features, you can decide whether the CT is required or not. Uh, obviously, I am not, uh, I personally feel that the patient had a fall secondary to hypotension because of the anaphylaxis and she had this injury. Uh, that was the reason because whatever history we are attributing all together, it looks like that. Am I right? So, uh, maybe uh, then she was admitted? No, she uh, was like observed for 6 hours and then we discharged. So, what is the most important advice that you will give her at time of discharge? Uh, Two advices that you need to give her. We should uh, tell her to stop taking the drug. Okay. Uh, stop taking the drug which has precipitated precipitated this event. So, sarashopeptidase was the drug that was attributed. So, sarashopeptidase is not very common, but still we will tell her to avoid that agent. Then, next advice is a head injury advice. Obviously, you will give a head injury advice. No? So, what are the factors that she should report to the ED immediately? Clinical features. Yeah, loss of consciousness. Loss of any seizure. LOC, any drop in GCS, yeah, any loss of C, multiple episode of seizure, vomiting, vomiting, persistent vomiting. headache, any focal deficit, she should report to the ED immediately. So, that are the head injury advice, the routine head injury advice that you will give for any patients that you are planning to discharge from the ED. So, uh, what, how, what all medications you will give, you, give her at time of discharge? What is the role of steroids? What is the role of uh, antihistamine, H2 blockers and all? 
antihistamines uh, are the second line of management and we can uh, antihistamines reduce the uh, histamine release is the cause so that will be reduced by antihistamines okay and hydrocot uh, it will help in management of the uh, bronchospasm okay that will take okay. see whatever be the drug hydrocortisone will take 3 to 4 hours to act so when the steroids that is why in, you look into the algorithms they are not mentioning hydrocortisone anywhere because hydrocortisone is not a drug that will act immediately it will take time adrenaline is a drug that will act immediately so that is the reason why adrenaline Thank is the you. drug of choice hydrocortisone maybe you can give to decrease her inflammatory all those responses and all those things but the action will be uh, not immediately it will be after oral or IV which one you wanted to give steroids both has got equal efficacy. Mm -hmm. If you want to give IV orally, both has got equal efficacy. Even COPD exacerbation patient is coming, he is able to take orally, you can give oral steroids. Equivalent steroids, but you need to give. So, whatever be the equivalent, 1 mg per kg of Dexa, uh, or, uh, uh, prednisolone Dexa. or oisolone, whatever be the drug, you need to give. So, only that is the most important thing. But bioavailability is the same. Only problem is that gastritis and all issues might happen when you are taking orally. But IV also uh, can be preferred in that situation. So that is in a nutshell. So my uh, the take home message will be majority of the time it can be anaphylaxis but if you don't find any trigger or you don't see any skin arctic area features mm -hmm. keep these three differential diagnoses hereditary angioedema, okay. ARB induced yes. angioedema and idiopathic okay. angioedema. So these are the differentials that you need to understand. Anything else that you want to add on? Mm -hmm. Practice point that is the only thing. Okay. When you going for an exam they will ask you to test for mast cell tryptase okay. level which we are not doing here so that is why all your uk based exam when you are going you have to tell send one mast cell now when after two hours you have to send one how the response is there and all but here we are not routinely practicing that and, okay uh, uh, not here we don't give here usually epipens can be given epipen can if be given here recurrent. also it can be used here also if like pretty bad anaphylaxis that you are getting in and that is a because recently I had a patient who had come in with the twice history of bee sting causing him anaphylaxis so he is requesting whether he can have an epipen okay. so there is no point against using an epipen but the problem is the availability and the cost okay. factor so uh, available the cost factor is something previously like two three years back when I inquired it was somewhere around 15 to 20 thousand so it's a single use after that you have to discard you cannot reload the drug again so when you compare life versus money so that always 15 thousand is nothing when you compare so if they are affordable and they can use it people now I think it is 5,000 6,000 it is available uh, but you need to it is not freely available over the counter but if you need to wait and all you will get somebody is there in abroad you can ask them to bring in and they can use it a pen. so they basically wrap it in their uh, uh, hip just like a belt and it will be hanging so that is what a pen is about they will just take this and they will just click it in the anterolateral aspect of the thigh so that is regarding a pen and uh, oh. adrenaline uh, injections to be kept at home there is no recommendation as such mm -hmm. one ampule of adrenaline uh, it hardly cost you two rupees but if you are frequently, you need to think about it because the patient is developing very frequent anaphylaxis. We need to sometimes teach the bystander or somebody to do this thing. If they can give it, because before the time they reach the hospital, they might uh, die because of the airway compromise and the circulatory collapse. Okay. okay. Anything else you want to add? Yes, okay. Fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.